Greetings in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I want to thank you for joining us today on this important topic uh, of COVID-19 and children. We know that there are many parents that are concerned over the well-being of their children during this time. Many are also confused about this new strain of COVID-19, namely the Delta variant and its effects on children. Today we have with us Dr. Rochelle, who's a pediatrician at Albert Latuli Hospital. I want to give you a brief bio of who she is. She commenced um, with her biomedical science in 2004 at Howard College. She then commenced with the MBCHB at Walter Susulu University in 2006. She graduated in 2010. And from 2010 to 2015, she worked in seven different hospitals in Durban and Peter Marisburg. She commenced specialization in pediatrics in 2017 and qualified four years later as a pediatrician. She's presently managing the pediatric and gastroenterology and rheumatology departments at, as a consultant pediatrician at Incorsi Albert Latuli Memorial Hospital. She's married to Kenneth and mother to Eliana Zuria Singh. And so we're excited to have her today, and we know that she's going to be giving her professional perspective. So thank you, Dr. Rochelle Ann Singh, for being with us today. I think it's important for us to get a proper medical perspective of what's really going on and how we can help our children to ensure that they are safe, that they are strong, and that they are healthy. There's so much of false information that's going on, and it's striking fear in many. So I believe it's absolutely imperative for us as parents to educate ourselves on how to deal with the matter at hand. So Dr. Rochelle will be able to advise us on what to do even if our children do contract the virus. She will be addressing uh, what symptoms to look out for in children and also small babies. I'm sure that you've heard the saying that prevention is better than cure. So our good doctor will be advising us on what we can do to try and prevent COVID in children. We'll be addressing the topic of masks and mothers who have COVID with newborn babies. We want to encourage you to share this broadcast. I believe it's a very important topic, and I believe it can really help someone at this time with what we are going through. So we're going to start. Thank you, Dr. Rochelle, for joining us. We want to thank you for making the time to do this very important interview. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm really happy to be part of this protest. Hey, thank you once again. We want to go straight into the topic, and uh, I'm sure you agree with me. This is a really important topic. So my first question to you is, what is so different about this new variant? And is it true that children are more susceptible to it? So yes, indeed, um, this topic of COVID is very important. But uh, to tackle that question, let's first discuss what a new variant means. So we are constantly gaining knowledge of COVID, and as the virus is evolving, uh, part of this evolution is in its mutation. So why do viruses mutate? It's a mechanism to ensure survival of its species. For example, if a virus had to infect a person and the person dies, the virus dies with the person and that's the end of it. So the virus tries to overcome this by uh, undergoing mutations to become more contagious so it's easily spread and also to try to cause more severe disease and also to try to cause reinfection. So the first mutated strain was found in the UK that was called the alpha strain. And then in South Africa, the beta strain emerged. And then in Brazil, it was the gamma strain. And of recent, it's the delta strain. And this was first found in India. So to answer the second part of your question, are children more susceptible? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, this variant increases its transmissibility um, throughout the different age groups, so throughout the population. So it's now become more contagious. And also it's more contagious also with people that are vaccinated and those that are non-vaccinated as well. It also has a higher risk of reinfection. So if you had COVID and you get this Delta strain, you can become reinfected with COVID. So whether it causes more severe diseases, however, is not proven at this stage, but it's definitely more contagious and therefore we are seeing more cases. Wow, thank you. I think that's extremely informative. So what symptoms should we look out for in children and in babies? Okay, so first, uh, it's important to understand that children of all ages can get COVID. Uh, however, they are generally less affected than adults. And their symptoms, if they do have symptoms, they are much milder. Although majority of children have no symptoms. 
but not having symptoms does not mean that they are not infected. Um, some studies were done where they took um, populations where there were high positive cases and they tested adolescents and children irrespective of symptoms. And they found that children above the age of five had COVID infection without showing symptoms similar to that of adults. So that being said, a small proportion of children do have, get severe COVID and um, especially those that are high risk. And the high risk group includes children with obesity, diabetes, and underlying chronic conditions, like um, if they're born with a heart condition or chronic lung diseases, uh, cancer patients, or patients that are on treatment that suppress the immune system, like those on chemo drugs or long-term steroids, and also small babies, especially premature babies. So what symptoms can we look for? So first of all, small babies are unable to verbally express themselves. But I'm sure that most parents know exactly when their baby is not feeling well. Uh, but here are some of the things to look for in a small baby. So that they will have fever, cough. You'll notice that they may be breathing faster or the effort of breathing may be increased. So you, they'll have in drawing of the chest wall. They'll have nasal congestion. And the first sign um, that a baby is actually sick you'll find that they will have difficulty or poor feeding. Um, and in children, COVID also manifests in the form of, of vomiting and diarrhea. So uh, in older kids, they'll have, like adults, the colds and flu symptoms, which is fever, a cough, which is generally dry. They can have shortness of breath, muscle pains, uh, sore throat, runny nose, headaches, and as well as GI symptoms again. So they'll have abdominal cramps, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And they also uh, have loss of taste and smell. But another entity which is very important to discuss in the pediatric population that I want to talk about, um, and our first encounters with COVID in children was actually from the syndrome. And it's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, MIS, in children. So it's MISC. So we call it MISC for short. So this occurs in children two to six weeks after they've been infected with COVID. And these patients, because they don't have symptoms, we don't even know that they had COVID before. And then they present to us a month later, or weeks later with multi-organ failure. So it's a very devastating syndrome and all your organs fail. And I remember my first encounter with the Mercy patient was a young boy whose grandfather had COVID and was on home oxygen living with them. And he had no symptoms. But then weeks later, he presented with multi-organ failure. And after doing an antibody test, we noted that he actually did have COVID. So some of the symptoms that need to be wary, especially if a child had at some point been exposed to a COVID positive person, even if they had no symptoms, is first of all, a persistent fever. Um, almost all patients present with this and persistent in that it lasts for three to five days. They have severe GI symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And the abdominal pain can be so excruciating uh, it may seem like an appendicitis. Uh, they may have a rash over the body, a conjunctivitis, so the eyes get red, watery, or painful. And they have um, the oral involvement, so the lips get red, swollen. Um, they have a swollen tongue. We actually call it a strawberry tongue because it gets very red and swollen. They may even have uh, seizures or stroke or have confusion or be lethargic. Um, and then the hands and feet may be swollen. They can have swollen glands, which are called your lymph nodes in your neck. And this uh, syndrome also affects the heart. So you can, they may present with a crushing chest pain and even shortness of breath. But I guess if you look at these symptoms, they are quite severe. And whether a parent is aware of this MISI or not, it will prompt you to get uh, emergency assistance. So if the child is any of the above, uh, I suggest that you take a child to the hospital. Okay, I think that's extremely informative. Uh, this is another important question also. You know, I've got two children and I want to know as a parent as well, are there things that we can do as parents in terms of diet, and supplementation in order to strengthen the immune systems of our children? Okay, so that's a very important question. And I know many parents are concerned about their children and they want to protect and try by all means to prevent their children from getting COVID. Um, but first, let me say this, just remember to remain calm, not panic or become anxious, because like the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. 
And remember that children feed off parents' emotions and they look to the parents as a source of protection, if you may say. And if they feel their parents are scared or anxious, then they will start having feelings of anxiety and fear. And this leads to stress. And then stress re results in the release of certain stress hormones, which have a negative impact on their immune system. And this results in impairment of the immune system. So in a Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. So if you're talking about prevention, um, let's look at some of the key aspects. The first thing is washing hand hygiene. So you're washing hands as frequently as possible, especially before touching food or eating, after removing your mask, before touching your face. And also with hand washing, you need to make sure it's also adequate. So the front of your hands, the back, the sides, and you can sing the happy birthday song so that you know you adequately um, had enough time to wash your hands properly. If you're unable to wash your hands, then sanitize. So sanitize is also important um, with at least a 70% alcohol solution. Uh, teach children respiratory etiquette. In other words, if they're not wearing masks, to cough or sneeze into their elbows. So that's the safest way. And with wearing of masks, they must cover their face and their nose, not to touch the outside of the mask and to also remove them safely and remember to wash their hands thereafter. And then physical distancing. So I don't like to use the word social distancing, I'd rather say physical distancing because you can social, you can physical distance uh, without being socially distant. And these days with um, video calling, you can still uh, be able to be in contact with your close family and friends. And even when you're going out, you can still socialize. However, to maintain that two meter distance is so important. And this is actually the best way to prevent spread. Um, in terms of getting the immune system, you want a healthy immune system. So you want to boost the immune system. So the most important um, nutrients we look at is vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. So there are immune boosters available at your pharmacy. Um, for example, Zimplex Junior includes uh, zinc and vitamin C. There's vitamin D supplementations, vitamin C supplementations, and also multivitamins like a Viral Guard, Krish Guard, Baby Guard. Um, but also to include in your diet, to so sources of uh, food with good or a good uh, amount of vitamin C, like your fruits, such as guava, strawberries, oranges, kiwi fruits, lemons, um, and your veggies. Interestingly, fresh thyme, uh, it actually has three times more vitamin C than oranges. So next time you eat, just sprinkle some thyme over your food and it's a good source of vitamin C. Uh, then there's parsley, kale, and broccoli. Foods rich in vitamin D include your oily fish, like salmon, sardines, canned tuna, uh, egg yolks, uh, milk, and your cereals and some orange juices have been fortified with extra calcium and vitamin D. And then with zinc, that comes mostly from your red meat, uh, poultry, and also cereals, and also baked beans and chickpeas. So basically, if you have a well-balanced meat meal, you would be able to um, supplement good nutrient intake and have a good immune system. And then lastly, I think it's important to also sit and talk to your children. This is, as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of information circulating about COVID that may be confusing for them. So you can sift out the information and give them good information in the way that they will understand, uh, but again, without fear or anxiety. And first you can ask them what they know, so you can ascertain the type of information that they are receiving and offer them comfort, help them feel safe, speak calmly, and help them also feel in control by teaching them things about like sanitizing, hand hygiene, and physical distancing. Okay, excellent. You know, you alluded to, to masks. And so can you talk about, you know, the wearing of masks in, in children and its role in preventing COVID? Now, I know that I used to get concerned about my son. You know, he's 13 years old and got some allergies and using masks. And you wonder whether it's uh, doing any damage. Uh, so maybe you could just uh, inform us uh, the role of masks. Sure. So according to WHO and uh, UNIFES, UNICEF, sorry, it's not advisable for small children, meaning less than six years, to actually wear masks because they can cause more harm than good. Um, there's a risk of suffocation, there's risk of them not taking off the mask properly and um, therefore exposing them to the virus. Um, and then between the age groups of six to 11 years, 
Um, that could be based on a few factors. So one of the factors is if the child lives in an area where there's widespread transmission of the virus, which I think is applicable to anywhere in South Africa right now. Um, also the ability of the child to safely and appropriately wear a mask. So between six and 11 years, can the child fully understand how to wear the mask, how to take it off and to wash their hands thereafter? Um, they should still have adequate adult supervision. And the mask, it must be made of breathable fabric. Um, not vinyl, and it should have at least two layers of material uh, and a correct size to adequately cover the entire nose and the mouth. So children between two to five years, um, wearing of the mask is determined by the safety and the capacity, again, of the child's understanding and the ability to wear a mask with a minimal supervision. Less than two years, it's not advisable. Patients that fall in the high-risk category, like I described earlier, um, it's preferably that they use the blue surgical masks. Um, an alternative to face mask is a face shield. However, it's not equivalent in terms of protection um, to a mask. Um, but if you are using a face shield, then you should cover the entire face um, up to below the face and the chin. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is another very important question, you know, thinking about mothers with newborns. And I'm sure it's Quite traumatic for them, um, you know, the, exactly what's happening in our country with this pandemic or throughout the world, sorry. Uh, so what about mothers with symptomatic COVID with newborn babies? What advice can you give to them? Okay, so first of all, babies, they can get COVID, however, it is uncommon. And those that do become infected uh, either have no symptoms or have very mild disease. However, there is a risk and there are some babies that can develop severe COVID disease. Uh, with pregnancy, um, it's not uh, established yet if the virus can be transmitted um, intrauterine, like through the mom to the baby. However, most of the COVID positive patients are babies uh, due to the respiratory droplets from the mom, especially when she's nursing a baby. So again, um, the high-risk babies would be those that have or are born with underlying medical conditions or if they are premature. But in any case, these babies would be admitted to an NICU. Um, or if the mom is very ill with COVID, then separation from the baby is necessary. However, let's say the baby and the mom is well, or the mom discovers she had COVID after the baby is born and she's at home now and everything is okay. Uh, she can still care for a baby by taking precaution because we know that early close contact and bonding between mother and baby has many benefits and breastfeeding is also very important. So as, men, as I mentioned just now, the risk of baby getting COVID um, is rare, but there is a still small risk and some mothers may not want to take any risk. But if a mother chooses that she wants to nurse a baby, then she can take the following precautions. So she needs to just ensure that she's washed her hands. Again, hand hygiene is very important. Uh, before breastfeeding or handling her baby. Um, she must also ensure she wears a face mask whenever she nurses her baby, uh, but do not under any circumstances put a mask on a baby, because that will lead to suffocation. Uh, if some mothers may not want to take the risk, they, may, they can have an option of getting a caregiver and preferably someone that is fit and healthy. And so the mom can express breast milk so that the caregiver can feed the child. But again, with the expression of the milk, hand hygiene is important. She should wear a face mask to uh, not risk contaminating the breast milk. So now when is the mom no longer a potential risk? So if at least 10 days have passed since the symptoms first appeared, um, or if she was very sick at least 20 days, and at least 24 hours since the last fever without use of any medication, and the symptoms have improved. So after that, she's uh, no longer a potential risk to the baby. Wow, I think that's going to help many, many mothers with little babies. So that's some excellent advice from the good doctor. I think it's, it's good today that we're getting proper advice from someone who's dealing on a daily basis with um, COVID patients and that uh, can inform us uh, the right protocols, the right treatments and prevention. So. Once again, thank you, Dr. Rochelle, for joining us. And um, also there's different tests. I know there's PCR, antibody tests, and antigen tests. Could you please uh, explain to us the difference about these tests? 
Okay, so there's three types of tests, yeah, as you mentioned. So the PCR test, so that's the test that we generally do. Um, and this is where you go generally through a drive-through to the hospital or clinic and they stick a you know, big ear uh, down your nasal passage to get into the back of your throat or they just do an oral swab to the back of your throat. So this test detects the genetic material of the virus. So it actually tells you if the virus is present um, and this is the most accurate test. Then there's an antigen test. So this test detects the proteins that are on the outer shell of the virus. It's rapid, it's uh, results, you get your results in within 15 minutes, it's cheaper, and it's highly specific, which means if it is positive, it means that you definitely have the virus. However, it's not very sensitive, which means if it's negative, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have COVID. So if you do a rapid test and it's negative, but you ha have symptoms, you should go on and do a PCR. And then we have the antibody test. So this tells us if a person has had COVID before, and this test becomes important, for example, as I mentioned in this MASI, um, where a child may not have had symptoms, but now they come in really sick. And then if you do antibody tests, it tells us if the child had actually been infected with COVID previously. Okay, excellent. Um, it's extremely overwhelming for any parent to know uh, that their child has tested COVID positive. So what's the first thing or what's the protocol if your child has tested positive with COVID? Okay, so first thing is don't panic. <laughs> uh, majority of children have mild symptoms. Um, so at home, everyone should just stay at home until everyone is tested or symptoms are completely gone. Um, usually children usually get it from adults. But as I mentioned, this Delta variant is more contagious, so they can be spreading it, for example, um, in schools, etc. cetera. Um, try to keep other people away from your child as much as possible. Try to have just one caregiver looking after your child so that you limit exposure to other people in the house. Um, and the mom or whoever's taking care of the child needs to wear a mask um, and the child, if the child can. And if possible, try to have the child, sick child use a separate bathroom. But if this is not possible, then make sure you just wipe down the surfaces often. And everyone in the family, in the household, should practice hand hygiene more frequently. And use household cleaners to clean things that get touched a lot, like door handles, toys, remote controls. And then you want to continue using supplements to boost the immunity, like I've mentioned before. Um, and to help with the symptoms, you can use decongestion, uh, panado for fever. Ensure your child is well hydrated at all times. They may not feel like eating, but ensure that the fluid intake is good. And especially if there's vomiting or diarrhea, um, and you want to monitor that they don't get dehydrated. And also monitor how the child breathes. So if you feel they're breathing faster or they're becoming lethargic or any of the symptoms that we mentioned earlier, then uh, you need to uh, seek medical attention. Well, we've come to the end of this interview and I think it's been extremely informative and we want to thank you once again, Dr. Rochelle, for your time. You're a busy, <laughs> busy person. So we truly appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us. And I think one of the things that I can take out from uh, what Dr. Rochelle has shared is don't panic. Um, there are ways and means to deal with these things. And it's important for us as parents to maintain our composure. Also, we trust in a living God. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that with God, all things are possible. But we also thank God for our doctors. We thank God for the wisdom that the Lord has given them, that they are able to advise us on ways that we can treat this virus. So we believe today that um, in Jesus Christ, we are victorious. Also, once again, we want to continue even to pray for all those that are in the front line that are serving this country. May the Lord bless you. So I pray that you would share this broadcast. I believe it's going to help many, many people that because people start panicking. They don't know what to do and uh, become disillusioned. And there is information, really good information out there. And I believe this is some of it. So please, if you could share this broadcast, I know it's going to help someone. So God bless you and God be with you.